Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Midweek Connections. Delighted to see you here. Appreciate your presence. Hope you got a packet of uh, songs and information for you, because that, that'll help guide us today. Today, we welcome our guest, um, the Live Oak High School Handbell Choir. They're directed by Dodie Morris. Why don't you go ahead and give them a hand just to make them feel uh, that's it. See how spontaneous they are, just on their own initiative. They, they, yeah, right, okay. I'm, I'm helping this group smile a little bit with us today. Um, they will ring three selections, and uh, the music to two of those are in your packet. They're hymn selections, or Worship the King is one, um, and the second one is the Were You There? We've just finished thinking about that and working with that through the Lent and Easter season. And then there's a song that Josh Groban sings. I think he may have been the first to sing it, though he didn't write it, You Raise Me Up. Uh, and it's a song of faith. Um, you'll notice that the Y of you is capitalized in this text for a reason. And actually, in reading about that a little bit, Marion and I were reading last night, and uh, this song helps speak of his faith. He's a part of the Episcopal tradition and um, loves to sing this, and it has great meaning for us. So you'll hear it with a handbell selection today. Later, uh, toward the end of our service, Caroline Russell is going to be here. Maybe you saw a few of the things that she's going to bring to tell us about Vacation Bible School. Thank you for those of you that bought, uh, brought bottle tops and jar lids. Um, just put them in the container back there. That's going really, really well. So um, just in the spirit of receiving a gift of music from these young people from Live Oak, Let's begin today. Ms. Morris. While they're getting ready for the next song, I want to tell you a little bit about this class. This is a one semester class. Um, some of them come back if they, if they like it or if they 
can't think of anything else to do the next, <laughs> the next semester because they have to have electives every year. But um, this is just a one semester elective. So we get students who have rung bells for maybe four, five, six years, and we get students who have not rung at all. <clears throat> and we get people who played the piano, and we get others who have just n never tried to read music at all. So we kind of blend that together. But the good news is they only have to play two bells. They've, they've got two letter bells, and of course all the sharps and flats that go with those two bells. And so they're responsible for that all semester. So um, I'm pretty proud of what they have done uh, this year because we've had some almost newbies in this group. Uh, and so they've done a lot of things and they're not afraid of anything. And so the, the piece that they just played is not simple. It's got a lot of different things in it, but uh, they learned all the little techniques that they need, so I'm very proud of them. The next song is Were You There? And it, of course you know that it's an old spiritual that talks about um, the idea of actually being in when Christ was crucified and when he rose from the dead and, and how much we would love to have been an actual eyewitness to that wouldn't that have been great but we've got witnesses in our scripture that tell us all about it so we in our mind we can be witnesses We really appreciate the opportunity to come play. Uh, they appreciate the opportunity to get out of class, so <laughs> they're enjoying it. But uh, they also like to play for people, and so you have been very gracious to let us come today. Um, this last piece, I've looked at the lyrics a lot, and I'm so glad that, that William and Mary Ann actually found Josh Groban's thoughts about this, because as I was reading the lyrics and typing them out to send to you, to put out for you today, I, scripture just kept going through my mind, and I kept thinking, surely this is a, this is a, a Christian song. It is a Christian song. You, it, when you think about uh, all the, the, well, the passages that we had on Sunday about rest and come to me all you a labor, uh, many of the things that, that we think about, um, well, and the, the other one I thought about is the joy of the Lord is our strength. So he does give us strength when we need it. 
and we know that it all comes from him. So this is our last piece. Thank you very much for letting us come. Thank you so very much, students. Hey, pause right where you are. Let us wave by and thank you and smile at you and blessings for what you've contributed to our time together today. Thank you. May you have a safe and good rest of the day. Um, handbell ringing, the art, the craft of that requires so much individual focus, but it's one of the truly ensemble kind of experiences. You have to be connected with the fellow ringers that are around you. And uh, Ms. Morris does a wonderful job with that group. And just to think it changes from year to year depending on who wants to be in there. Dodie's done some excellent work um, along with Tammy Benton, two of our members that have been at Live Oak, working with the music ministry, music department there. So if you see Dodie and Tammy, just give them a good word of thanks and appreciation for that. A little bit of information for you about the hymn, How Great Thou Art. Many of you may know some of this. It may be a little bit um, new to, to some of you. Unfortunately, our copy machine was a little bit down. So that third line says, although written in the past century, the hymn became familiar to congregations just since the close of World War II. And it, there's a little bit more history there that will kind of guide you in understanding. This is one of the hymns that was selected by you as one of the favorites among us. Um, so it, it got one of the top votes and we'll continue, the times that we meet, we'll continue to, to sing these uh, top, top vote getters as it were. Remember I mentioned last week there were 99 different hymns listed on those forms that you filled out. So that shows a, a vast repertoire of hymnody that we know and that we love and we sing. Turn the page if you would, there's a wonderful Scripture there drawn from Psalm 145 that will lead us into the singing of How Great Thou Art. Um, and these are selected verses that just tend to really flow. 
It's right on the page there. It's right at the bottom of the hymn, How Great Thou Art. So find that, if you would, because I'd like for, for you to begin and to read the light print and let me follow today with the bold print. I'll speak it all so we get it on the recording. But would you begin with me, Psalm 145, these selected verses. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Let's stand as we sing. Shall bow in humble adoration 
and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to how great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Scripture this morning will come from the little book of Jude. If you'll find it with me, uh, don't need to give you a chapter number. There's only one. If you need a hint finding it, just start at Revelation and start flipping forward. Let me read for us uh, just the first two verses of this, this slim little book, Jude 1 and 2. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Let's pray. Lord, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for calling us together in this room, in this hour, in the presence of the Spirit of Christ. God, we thank you for your word. God, we pray that that, that Spirit of Christ would open the word to us today. God, I pray that you would speak to me, that I might speak to these, your people. God, we pray that you would Give us the wonderful words of life in a, in a fresh way today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to pause for a little tech support here because I'm soft-spoken. Andy's a good uh, AV guy. Don't, don't block my face, Andy. These people have come a long way to see this. Y'all don't have to laugh that hard at it. If you're like me, you found yourself wrestling with a problem. And that problem is how you start an email. Salutations give me all sorts of trouble. There's a whole variety of ways of doing this. There's, a, there's just the straightforward name the person you're addressing. Susie, comma. Matt, comma. Lisa, comma. That feels a little brusque to me sometimes. It's a, it's a little rough. So then there's the, the tried and true dear so-and-so. Well, that works for people if they're actually dear to you. Sometimes it feels just a, just a tad disingenuous if you're writing, dear insurance adjuster, <laughs> dear podiatry nurse, dear IRS auditor, Oh, these are people, lovely human beings made in the image of God. Jesus loves them all. They're not always particularly dear to me. It feels, it feels a little deceptive to, to say so. Well, then there's the old, old business letter standby, to, to whom it may concern. You put a colon there on the end to show that it's, it's real official and business-like. It's not, it's not casual like the comma. I don't know about you, when I write to whom it may concern, it sounds like I'm, I'm not totally sure that what I'm about to write really concerns much of anybody. I'm pretty confident it doesn't concern whoever I'm sending it to. How do we open these emails? 
it's not a new problem with email. This is this has existed for a long time. Maxine, I know you're you're a serious letter writer. You've you've been wrestling with this for for years. It goes back long before any of our time. This goes back as long as people have been sending written communication back and forth to each other. Since most of our New Testament scriptures are letters, these apostles and evangelists had to wrestle with this same kind of question. How am I going to address these people? And it becomes that much harder when it's not this person, but these people. When you're addressing a group, those challenges just sort of compound. How, how are we going to get the ball rolling with this communication? Sometimes I think because of this, because we fall back on these, you know, just kind of tried and true crutches, dear so-and-so, and to whom it may concern, dear, dear Betty Smith or current resident, we tend to just sort of, sort of get blinded to these salutations. We skim right past them. We jump right over them. They're, they're just kind of filler words before you get to the, to the real communication. And for a great many of our emails, that's, that's probably true and probably about the right way to handle it. But for these words of scripture, inspired by that spirit of Christ, these, these salutations can be so important. So I wanna just pause and camp out here for a few minutes this morning. We have these two little verses of this slim little letter because there's some real good news here. And we need it because most of the rest of the letter of Jude is just a, just a scrappy, rough letter. Jude had to deal with some stuff. Verse 3, he writes, dear friends. He couldn't get away from the dear, but I think he really meant it because he, he, he put the friends on there too. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once and for all entrusted to God's holy people. He said, I need to encourage you. I need to raise you up to contend for some things. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to roll up your sleeves and, and fight a little bit here. And boy, Jude does. But before he gets there, he starts with these gospel words, these words of good news that, that frame and motivate that encouragement he's going to bring to the people. Jude writes, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father, who are kept for Jesus Christ. Called, loved, and kept for Jesus Christ. Jude, Jude did a favor to, to three-point preachers like I tend to be. Breaks out really easy here. First of all, he says, the people he's sending the letter to are called. So that raises the question for us, or at least it should, called by whom? Chip Conyers was a good friend of, of several of you in this room, I know. And uh, Chip did the service to the church to point out uh, what really should have been obvious to us all along, that having a call implies a caller. It's an inherently relational kind of word. It's a communication word. If, if there is a call that's gone out, there's, there's somebody on the other end of the line. That should be obvious to us, but sometimes it's hidden right there in plain sight. I think some of the reason why we're, we're conditioned in so many ways when we hear that word calling, especially when we talk about it in the church, we start to think in terms of a, a task. We start to think in terms of something that we're supposed to do. Not a week goes by that I don't talk to some of our college students, some of our grad students, seminary students, and say, oh, boy, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to figure out my calling, I'm trying to recognize my calling. What, what's, God, what's God calling me to? That's a good question for them to wrestle with. It's a good question for us to wrestle with. God keeps calling. But all too often when they, when they talk about that, really they're talking about a job description. <laughs> they're talking about picking a major, or picking a concentration. Maybe they're, they're talking this season of the year about sending out applications for their first job, trying to decide, what, what am I called to do? I believe God does call us in those ways. Those are, those are good questions to ask. But before God calls us to do much of anything, God calls us just to be his, to be alive. Dr. Conyers loved to point out to us that the, the sort of call story par excellence in the scripture was the story of Lazarus. You all remember the story, John 11. Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, have sent to Jesus and the disciples. They said, our brother is sick. He is, he's at the point of death. Jesus, you got you to gotta get here. 
Jesus says, well, well, we'll get to it, guys. Slow down. The, the disciples didn't like it. They said, no, no, Jesus, we have got to go. They said, just, just cool your jets a little. We'll be okay. So they finally get there. And they find out that Lazarus has been dead for three days. Jesus is met by these two sisters, just, just racked by grief and mourning and loss. They come, they, one comes to him just, just broken and hurting, and the other, the other comes pretty confrontational. She said, Lord, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. He has trust and faith in him, but there's a, there's a little accusation there, too. There's a little barb. Why didn't you come quicker? Why weren't you here sooner? Jesus says, come on. Let's go out to the tomb. They get there, and he asks people to open it up. The sisters are just mortified by this. They say, no, we're not going to do this. It's been three days. He, he stinketh. Sometimes you just got to lean back on the King James. <laughs> Jesus said, just trust me. I've got this. So against everybody's better judgment, they listen to him maybe according to their better judgment. He says, Lazarus, come out. Lo and behold, old dead stinking Lazarus comes out. Chip says, that is the story of calling in the Bible. What was it that Jesus was calling Lazarus to do? Not a whole lot. He called him to live. He called him to come to him. Jesus wasn't asking Lazarus to perform. He wasn't asking him to get any work done, accomplish any task. Not then, anyway. That would follow on later. At first, Jesus just called him to life and to, to being his friend again, to being with him. Jesus wasn't asking him to perform. He just wanted them to be together. As I thought about this story this week, my, my mind immediately went back to that precious, precious story that Julia told us on Sunday morning about little Devin from her basketball team. The story's too good. We, it certainly bears telling at least twice. It probably bears telling 102 times this week. Little Devin sitting there riding the bench over in the gym across the street. Doesn't care a thing in the world about the game of basketball. Second quarter comes around. Coach Julia says, Devin, get, it, get in the game, man. It's your time to play. It's your time to play. Devin's just having too much fun swinging his little feet. He said, no. Oh, I'm having fun here on this plank. I don't want to go play that game. Julia's trying to encourage him to say, no, Devin, your, your granddad's here. He's, he's come a long way to watch you play. He wants to watch you. Are you going to let him down? He said, he didn't come to watch me. He came to see me. Could it just be that maybe God has called you, not because he wants to watch you do anything, but he just wants to see you? Told Julia she could have just parked the bus right there. Jesus calls us to, to come and to be seen. Jesus also calls us to come and see him. That's the call throughout the Gospels, the Gospel of John particularly. Time and again and again, there's this refrain of Jesus calling out to people, come and see, come and see, come and see. He gives an invitation. I want you to notice two things about this call from the Lord. One, God always gets the initiative here. God gets to make the first move. Now, I have friends that will take this off in some wild directions and, and, and end up making it all just this very mechanical sort of transaction that, you know, God's just moving all the, all the battleship pieces on the board and, and we're just robots following along. I don't think that's it at all. But God gets to go first. We're coming now right into the, the sweet spot of baseball season. Any, any of y'all baseball fans? I, uh, I had a very ill-fated uh, attempt at coach pitch early in life and sort of soured me on the game until just the last couple of years. I've kind of fallen in love with baseball again. One of the things I like about baseball is, is there's no big mystery about the start of the game. Basketball, you get the tip off. Football, you go out and flip a coin. What's that about? The Super Bowl, the referee has to explain which side is the heads and which is the tails. Baseball, you don't fool with any of that. The home team is always going to get to throw out 
the first pitch. Well, if we are playing anywhere in this grand creation, God is the home pitcher. Father, Son, and Spirit are the home team. They get to throw that first ball. They get to take the initiative. As they do, it's also an invitation. It's not this robotic, mechanized process. It's not some kind of assembly line. It's that invitation. Come to me. Come and see. It's gracious. It's gentle. God, God honors our freedom as people made in his image. Invitations are special kind of things. Mary Brandon is uh, just, a, just a raging extrovert, as most of you have come to know. I, I think it's a little bit of God's God's sense of humor on two fairly introverted parents to give us just the most sociable child the world has ever seen. She loves going to people's houses. She's, she's discovered visiting. All the time she'll ask us, hey, can we, can we go and eat dinner with Helen tonight? Can we go swim with Molly Catherine? Can I go over and see Miss Karen? We've had to tell her, Mary Brandon, you, we can do some of those things, but we have to we have to be invited. We can't, just, we can't just drop in on these people. Like, well, why not? They said come back any time. <laughs> uh, well, well, yeah, they're, they're just nice, sociable people themselves, but ooh, you need an invitation to come. You, you need to be invited. Mary Brown will say, well, get your phone. Call them. Tell them to invite me. <laughs> she so much wants to be with people and is just yearning for that invitation well, here's the good news. If, if you're wondering if God has invited you, you don't have to get on the phone and call and remind him to do it. You don't have to sit around waiting. You don't have to go and knock and knock and knock on the door and, and hope that he's home, hope that he hears. The invitation has already gone out. God's taken the initiative. He's thrown that first pitch open invitation. We all have been called by God. And we've received this invitation because we are also loved in God the Father. I love how the, the Net Bible translates this. It, it really sort of paints the picture of the image. It says, we've been wrapped in the love of God the Father. Ever experienced being wrapped in the love of a, of a parent? That love animates God's call and invitation to us. It, this description that we've been loved by God echoes that word, those words from Jesus' own baptism. Heavens just tore open. The voice of the Father said, this is my son whom I love. Same thing happened at the transfiguration. Jesus all of a sudden just displayed in splendor. Moses and Elijah have shown up from who knows where. You get that same voice. This is my son whom I love. And now here Jude writes, you're those ones called by God whom God the Father loves. Through that miracle of, a, of adoption, we've been brought in as sisters and brothers of Christ and in critically important ways, we relate to God the Father in the same way that Jesus does. That's wild. It's crazy stuff. It's good news. We've been called in the past by God's mercy. We are loved in the present, in that sort of eternal present, which is really past, present, and future. It's just, it's carrying all the way through. And then finally, Jude says that we are kept for Jesus Christ. Now, these prepositions are, are tricky. They're, they're ambiguous here. This, this could be kept for Jesus, and, and I think is. It also could be translated that we're kept by Jesus. Jesus is, is hanging on to us as his, his kind of prized possession. Mary Brandon will do this. She'll come home every day. She, she mules out three or four wood chips from the playground. She just clutches onto them like it's the, it's the most beautiful thing in, in all the world. Jesus hangs on to us that way. We are kept for him. It could even be put, we are kept in Jesus. We belong to him. 
Uh, Colossians 3 talks about how we've been raised together with Christ. So we need to set our minds on the heavenly places where he is. This call to, to live into who you already are. I think Jude is, is gathering up all of this, pulling all of this together, sort of deliberate ambiguity. We're kept for Jesus. We're kept by Jesus. We're kept in Jesus. It all holds together in him. We have been saved. We're being saved. And we're going to be saved. But there's this odd kind of kind of mystery that happens in the book of Jude. His lead punch of the whole thing is that we, we have been kept by, for, and in Jesus. And then in verse 21, as he's, he's wrapping up his letter, he gives this odd instruction. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Like, wait a minute, Jude. I thought, <laughs> I thought you said Jesus had that, <laughs> that covered. That was taken care of. That was off our plate. Now you're saying keep ourselves in God's love? There's this sort of paradox, this, this reciprocal responsibility here. Similar to in Philippians, when, when Paul writes to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, because God is in you to will and to work. Our minds can't totally process how all this holds together, but, but in this beautiful grace of God, it does. The best way I, I can make sense of this sort of this sort of reciprocal paradox here is, uh, oddly enough, thinking about changing a tire. I uh, had to change a tire this weekend. We came out for the last soccer game of the season, and uh, that tire was flat as flat can be. Uh, I'm not especially handy, and uh, changing that tire did not go well. If you if you look, I brought a little show and tell item. I've got my tire iron here. You don't want your tire iron to be this shape. This, this ought to be kind of a right angle here. This is, this is not what you want to see. I worked and worked and labored. Spent over an hour trying to get those lug nuts loosened up. I got, I got three of the five done. That's, that's 60%. That's, I, was, I was pretty proud of that. It's not enough to get the tire changed and get anywhere but it's, it was most of them. As I did, I, I kept flashing back, remembering as a boy, as my dad and I would, uh, would change tires together. He was, and is, extremely handy. Uh, he was a mechanic for a lot of his life, worked on cars, worked on bikes, did, did all sort of things. And, and he would call me out to, to work on changing tires, rotating tires, doing things together. We'd set up there in the driveway. He'd pull out the tools and explain what we were doing. Walk me through it step by step. As I was sweating and pouting and yelling and fussing on Saturday, I, I kept wishing that, that we were working on it together again. But as I thought back when I was a little boy, doing that with my dad, I remember I was doing real, actual, meaningful work. I was twisting the wrench. I was, I was loosening those lug nuts. I was putting the wheel on, loading up that spare. I was tightening them back down. I was, I was really actually doing stuff that mattered. It had real significance. There was, there was real risk to it, the car up on the jack. And my dad helped me understand, hey, here's the, here's the pitfalls and the dangers. This is what to be careful about. This is a, this is a grown up kind of thing. We need to treat this seriously. It had real outcome, real effects. So eventually, we got in those cars and went to wherever we were headed. But we were doing it together. I never had to come up with the master plan for the whole thing. I never had to have the strength in my little eight-year-old arms to get it done. I could do some of it. But I knew I didn't have to. I had this, this tremendous backstop behind me. I wasn't ultimately responsible for how it came out. I could, I could work and do real things with this sense of freedom because I knew that, I knew that my dad had it covered. I think that's a bit of, of how this works as we, as we work to keep ourselves 
in God's love. We do it knowing that we are kept by and for and in Jesus. He's, he's clutched onto us like his treasure. So as he's holding us, that, that gives us the freedom to try some things, to, to experiment. We can, we can do a high wire act knowing that we've got the, the rescue net of all rescue nets there below us. And Jude wraps up his whole letter just a few verses later, coming right back where he started, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. It ends with this doxology. It ends, it ends with blessing. He's started with verses of promise that were called and loved and kept. In between, there's been that contending. And boy, is it there. It's a, it's a scrappy letter. Some of this is, is sharp, sharp language from Jude. He writes about enemies who would come in and infiltrate and corrupt the church, dilute the gospel, send us astray. And Jude's not having it. He calls these people ungodly people. He says that they're blemishes at the love feasts. He says, hey, these, these are stains coming to the table of the Lord. He calls them clouds without rain, autumn trees without fruit. Then he starts to go Old Testament with them. He compares them to the fallen angels. He compares them to the denizens of Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, They've fallen into Balaam's era and Korah's rebellion. And then, and then finally, he says, these people are like irrational animals. After everything he said before, I thought, Jude, that doesn't sound very kind to the animals. It's a little unfair to the, the squirrels and the rabbits and such. Be gentle here. He's got a barb to it. He's got an edge to it. But the whole thing is bracketed off with this reminder of who we are. He says, there will be times and occasions to contend for some things, but do it in a certain kind of way because you're a certain kind of person. You've been called and you're loved and you're kept by God. I think implicit in that is also the reminder, as you do these things, remember these people that you're contending with may just fall in that same category too. This world will run up against some enemies. Some of them are not just enemies to us personally, or enemies to the gospel, but those people are loved by God. Those people have been called by God. They've, they've received this invitation. And maybe, just maybe, a great many of them will ultimately wind up kept by Jesus till the end. Some of them have been, some of them will be in days to come. We we don't get to know or decide that. We don't have to know or decide that. As we contend, we do so knowing that the people that can seem like our most bitter enemies don't have to stay that way. Because we've been called and loved and kept by Jesus, maybe just maybe one day they will be too. So out of this is a a beautiful gospel reminder of who we are, this reminder that we are called to be God's people. Those people conduct themselves in the world in particular kind of ways. Uh, we have a song that, that lifts up this idea. Uh, William, I invite you back to come and lead us as we sing. As, as William and Andy come, uh, let me offer a prayer for us. God, we thank you for your abundant gracious, surprising, mercy, love, and peace. God, we thank you that, that we are called and loved and kept by you. And help us not to skip over that lightly. You have lavished your love upon us. God, from that love, would you give us the confidence to contend where we need to contend? God, also the patience and the grace to love our neighbors as ourselves, loving, loving even our enemies. God, help us to stand firmly for the truth, but to do so with grace and love and mercy because you are gracious and loving and merciful. 
God, we are called to be your people, and we pray by your Holy Spirit you would make us worthy to the task. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for that word. This is the hymn that's on the back of your packet today, and it indeed um, speaks to us to be God's people, God's servants, God's prophets. That's outlined for us. Let's sing it together with joy and strength. Amen. You sing that with strength and joy. Thank you. A, a couple of things uh, to, to move us forward. Caroline, <laughs> this is great. Caroline Russell is coming forward. And I have asked her to come and say thank you for the bottle tops and jar lids that you're bringing. And to tell us a little bit about Vacation Bible School. Is that a chewy box on the back of that? I think it is. Okay, Caroline is our artist in residence that helps get Vacation Bible School, Beauty and Craft all put together. If you've been there on Sundays during Vacation Bible School, you'll see it all. We just work with it and love it. Um, so I, I want her to just tell you a little bit about what's going on, um, encourage you to continue to bring some things, and I think she wants to add one one more item since we're doing so well with bottle caps and jar tops. So, Caroline, come talk to us about VBS. Okay. Uh, well, just give me five more seconds. Um, uh, just in keeping with Baptist traditions, some assembly is required. <laughs> some assembly. Ta da! Pool noodles, swimming pool noodles, handcrafted to be more than just a noodle. Oh, my goodness. This looks like a jellyfish on the glass. A jellyfish. Yeah, cool. I see you smiling. Uh-huh.
That's like a loofah, like a scrubber thing. Yeah. Okay. Are you at liberty to uh, tell us the theme for Vacation Bible School yet? Is that still a hidden secret? No, it's not a secret theme. Uh, it's a scuba, so it's going to be under the water. Oh. Uh, Friendship with Jesus, scuba theme. So that's why everything's so aquatic. Okay. Oh, styrofoam, those little styrofoam. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So any, any kind of little styrofoam peanut, no matter what shape it is, that'll work. Oh. Uh, that's the bottle caps. And I'll be using them for other corals, too, because the plants speak texture. And, you know, uh, art is so tied off to texture matters. You know, if everything tasted or felt like oatmeal, that would be gross. So this is kind of different. Okay, come to the microphone for this next one. Okay, okay. Uh, you got to tell us about this. Okay, carpies. So it's going to be pan. I don't know if you can see it. Whoop. But on the side, we've got some barnacles going on. Mm-hmm. Um, barnacles from egg cartons. Yeah. So, and another thing, just realized this um, actually today because I was uh, used, these are water bottles. And I thought, Ooh. Well, it's going to stay. I thought it would be really cool if I had longer grass. I'm really wanting longer grass. So I'm in need of the Uber, you know, more Coke than you should drink in a year, those bottles, yeah, big ones. Bottles. Yeah, two liter bottles. And also these, I don't know what comes in them. Oh, water Barbara just- Tanny can tell you what comes in them. It's flavored water. Flavored water? Comes in these from, uh, what's the store? Aldi's. Aldi's has these. In fact, I have one of them back on the table back there. Mm. Yeah, this is great size. Yeah. And, the, and the flavored sense. water that comes in them is really pretty good, too. <laughs> so, oh, yes. Okay. Uh, um, still, still bottle caps. I'll use whatever I get. Um, but, yeah, that's mainly it. Okay, so if we have some old pool noodles, you can use the pool noodles. Continue with the bottle caps and the jar lids. A little necklace, beaded necklace. Any of y'all that went to Mardi Gras and still have these hanging around, (laughs) I could use those. Oh, Susie Jane's, you got to bring your Mardi Gras beads up and turn them in, (laughs) telling you what. Oh, this is exciting. So it's a scuba theme, underwater with Jesus, basically. Yeah. 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 It's it's about friendship. 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 Friendship with the Lord. And, and the, the decorations, I mean, that's, that's my big job, but it's just the hook. When Holly gets up there, oh, my gosh, yeah. she is amazing, amazing. And we're just, you know, I want to create an atmosphere that is cheerful, that's happy, that makes them glad to walk into the sanctuary, glad to walk into the church and just, you know, be totally immersed in Jesus. Um, it's, it's not the main job, but I, I think that um, it, it's a little part of it, a little part of it that's important. It's very important, and you do it very well. Thank yeah, you. how about a hand for our artists? Okay. What you won't need to bring are any of these kind of items, though. That's been a, a proven point. Caroline, thank you. That, that's remarkable. Now, um, where should we bring all these other things? Uh, is there a spot just to the main office? Yeah, I'll, I'll bring a box. Okay. It might be another chewy box. We'll have a, we'll have a big box. Way. If you have any of these items that you can bring, the loofah, the, the jar and bottle tops, the peanuts, the noodles from the pool side, the egg carton for barnacles, just beads, Pretty much, y'all, just bring anything. She'll fix, find something to do with it. She'll, <laughs> she'll fix it up. That's true. That's, that's pretty good. Well, this sounds very exciting. And thank you for taking time to bring and to show us. Uh, yeah, that's so good.
There, there are a number of ways that senior life folks have helped in Vacation Bible School over recent years, and we want to continue doing that. So I remember one, one uh, Vacation Bible School, how delightful it was that Maggie sat at the table with Barbara, and they handed out snacks to the kids for refreshment time. Gave them a smile, gave them a hello, gave them a snack. Uh, there are lots of ways that you can participate in teaching, in working, in helping with crafts. Do you need any help designing or, or putting anything together? Or we just need to bring you the items. Um, well, this is, this is your choice. Uh, having the items, that's amazing. It saves me a lot of time. Um, but I will have um, my studio open. I'm thinking on Tuesdays and Thursdays, if anybody wants to come by and help, I mean, if you can handle a glue dot, then you got it. Um, I, I do some hot glue, I have razor knives, I have scissors, but um, there are a lot of easy, easy I mean, things. Easy peasy. So Tuesday and Thursday, and where's the studio address? It is 2524 oh, I got you Columbus <laughs> Avenue. Columbus. I, I'll get that to you. Okay. I, I don't hardly reuse 25, it. 2524, I think that's something it. like that, Columbus. Columbus. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's a between lovely. Between 25th and 26th Street, the the one ways. Lovely little home over there that's become your studio. Yeah. Good deal. Okay. This is going to be fun and a, a delightful ministry to our children. So if you want to participate in any way, uh, make contact with Caitlin. Let her know what you might be interested in. If you want to help in, with Caroline in any of this uh, construction. I, I think that's remarkable what it's going to look like, how it's going to work. I did want to let you know, um, most of you are aware that Sandra Covington passed to eternal life on Sunday evening. And her memorial service is going to be next Wednesday, a week from today. So we will not meet midweek connections. We'll not do that at 11 o'clock so that you'll be able to focus on the service at 1.30 here in our sanctuary and it also helps Tammy out with food preparation. She's got a lot she's trying to do that day. So we'll just try to come and be supportive and be present for the, the memorial service at 1.30 next week. I'll ask Meg to send an email out. If I have your email address, that'll just be a little reminder for you, maybe like about Monday. So don't worry about it. If, you, if somebody needs to call me, feel free to call or text. Um, Continue to keep Julie and Jill and their extended family in your prayers and your concerns. Um, I don't know Jill's children and grandchildren, but they're scattered in different places in, in the United States, so it's taken them a while to kind of get things together. So that's why that's going to happen. Which will then leave us the, the two Wednesdays of the 15th and the 22nd. We will have midweek connections right here, and that will kind of wrap us up. Uh, for this this season of Midweek Connections. Any questions or thoughts or comments about any of that? Just want to make sure we're, we're clear there. Josh, anything else? That we're good? Okay. Thank you for being here today. Let's stay strong in these next several weeks, attending uh, the service next week and then being here for these last two times. By the way, on that last time we meet on the 22nd, I have twisted Rodney McLaughlin's arm again, and he's going to play some trumpet and flugelhorn for, for her. So it's a, it's a tough twist. You, you have to beg him mercilessly, but uh, he finally consented to uh, about halfway through the sentence. He said, okay, yes, I will. <laughs> uh, so y'all have a good lunch. I'll see you over there in a few minutes. We've got some bells to take care of here. Blessings for a good, safe day. Thanks a bunch. Go say hi to Tammy. <laughs>